Carl, for this uh, wonderful introduction, and thank you, Rafi, for inviting me here. Rafi Biar has special powers on me. When he invites, I come. And so, um, this, this lecture is, usually takes an hour and 15 minutes, um, but now it will take a shorter time. I was allocated a time until uh, 10 past 11, so I have three minutes to go. So the subject is the discovery of quasi-periodic materials. I will tell you the story of the discovery, and I will make sure that you will understand what it means, quasi-periodicity. Anybody who doesn't is welcome to call me. Let me take you to the mid-80s. The mid-80s of the last century were blessed with uh, three surprising discoveries on the nature of matter and its properties. These three discoveries came year after year, starting 1984, and all three of these received the Nobel Prize. So it's quite amazing. First discovery, chronologically, was the discovery of quasi-periodic crystals, and uh, the names, yeah. The names of that are my name, Ilan Blef, Denis Grathez, John Kahn, I'll tell you about these people. Next came the discovery of fullerens, fullerens, or buckyballs that uh, started the field of nanomaterials, and these are a flat layer of graphite that is folded to form a ball. This is it, carbon atoms. Next came the discovery of high temperature superconductivity. Now superconductivity was known from the turn of the last century. It was discovered in 1911 in Holland, and um, when uh, the high temperature superconductivity was discovered, it was a surprise because people did not expect superconductivity to be at such high temperature as liquid nitrogen temperatures. But there were no objections to the discovery. When fullerens were discovered, it was nice. Another way in which carbon atoms can form, they can form graphite, they can form diamond, they can form now buckyballs or fullerens, and later on nanotubes, and later on graphene, which is just a flat layer of graphite, and all these received Nobel, Nobel Prizes. No, there was no objection. But when quasi-periodic crystals were discovered, it met fierce opposition because it went against a paradigm, and that paradigm decided, or that paradigm defined the structure of crystals. And I will tell you what was before and what were the consequences of the discovery. But before we start, let me explain to you what is order, what is periodicity, and what is rotational symmetry, because I will use these terms shortly. Let's talk about order. Here we have a lattice of atoms, which is clearly ordered. If I will ask you to continue this in each and every direction, in this direction or in this direction, then you will know how to do that. So this is order. This is an order array of atoms in a plane. What about periodicity? Look at this direction, the red direction, up here. In this direction, you can clearly see that there is periodicity. The distance from this point to this point equals the distance from this point to this point, and so on. This is periodicity. If you multiply this distance by any integer, by any whole number, then you will find another one. If you multiply it by two, you get here. If you multiply this distance by four, then one, two, three, four, you get here. This is periodicity. And periodicity occurs in each and every direction. For instance, in this direction, and in this direction, each and every direction, periodicity occurs. What about the rotational symmetry? Here we have the same lattice, only that now I have added a handle on it so that you will know what happens when I rotate it. So I can rotate it 90 degrees, and it looks the same, except for the handle. 180 degrees, looks the same, 270, 360, it looks the same. So this lattice has a four-fold rotational symmetry. It means that you can rotate it one quarter of a turn, and every time you turn it one quarter of a turn, it looks the same. This is four-fold rotational symmetry. Now, we can skip the definition, but let's look at some examples. Here are a few examples. This card has a two-fold rotational symmetry. You can rotate it at 180 degrees, and it will look the same. This is threefold, this is fivefold, and this pizza has sixfold rotational symmetry. So now you know what is order, what is periodicity, and what is rotational symmetry. And now we can start talking. 
Let's say a couple words about crystallography. The science of crystallography really started in the year 1912. This is 100 years ago. This was also the year in which the cornerstone of the Technion was laid. So we also at the Technion celebrate 100 years. This is also the year in which our oldest member of faculty uh, was born. He died. His name was Lou Rosiano. And this is also the year in which the Titanic sank. So, some good things, some bad things. Crystallography started that year in an experiment by von Laue, a German scientist who proved in one experiment two amazing things. Number one, that X-rays have a wavy nature and that crystals have an ordered set of atoms. The atoms are ordered in crystal, as people suspected before, but they did not have the tool. Now, because you are a professional physicians, many of you, let me tell you something about X-rays. X-rays were discovered in 1895. And a year later, you could buy an X-ray machine to look at fractured bones. 1986, there were X-ray machines on the market. But it took 17 years to understand what X-rays were. People were using them, but they didn't understand what they were. Only with the experiment of Onlawe, 1912, people understood what x-rays were. And he started the uh, era of crystallography, the science of crystallography, by providing a tool, a precision tool of x-ray diffraction. This is different than what you do when you look at fractured bones. The same x-rays, less intensity, sometimes higher intensity in synchrotrons, but we know now that we have a tool that can decipher the structure of materials of crystals. Now, von Laue, when he looked at his crystal, it was zinc sulfide, the first one, and then he looked at many other crystals, and a year after him, the Bragg, father and son, provided us with the equation that made crystallography a science. All the uh, crystals that he studied were not only ordered, but also periodic. And for 70 years, from 1912 until 1982, hundreds of thousands of crystals were studied, and all of them were ordered, and therefore periodic, and they were periodic. They were ordered and periodic. They were ordered, therefore, crystals, and they were periodic. There was no exception. And so, over the years, a paradigm was developed, and the crystal definition was something like that. Here is a crystal definition from a book by uh, Caletti, X-ray diffraction. And this was the definition. A crystal may be defined as a solid composed of atoms arranged in a pattern periodic in three dimensions. So, a crystal is ordered and it is periodic. This does not come from any theory, but when you see hundreds of thousands of crystals which are ordered and periodic, and there is no exception, this is the definition came from observations. Another definition, different words, we should not go through it, different words, but the same thing it is, ordered and periodic. This is a crystal. Now, let me take you to a book, uh, which is uh, the book of solid state physics by, uh, by Kittel. We studied it at the Technion. Thousands of students studied it around the world. And this book said the following. We can make a crystal from molecules which individually have a five-fold rotation axis. But we should not expect the lattice to have a five-fold rotation axis. What does it mean? It means that a lattice, which is an array of atoms, such as the ones that I have shown you on the board before, instead of an atom, you can put in a molecule, a set of atoms. And of course, in biology, these molecules can be large, very large. As you know, they are not received a Nobel Prize for deciphering the structure of a very large molecule, right? Okay, so each molecule can have a five-fold rotation symmetry, but the lattice itself cannot have it. Why so? Because of geometrical reasons, we should not go into it right now. But this was the rule, and this was accepted by everybody. Let me show you now a picture of atoms in a diamond. This is taken by high-resolution electron microscope. And each white spot here is an atom 
So you can see the atom, each one of these spots is an atom. And clearly you see that there is periodicity. Can you follow the arrow? There is periodicity in this direction, and there is periodicity in this direction, and there is periodicity in this direction. Any direction you go, you can clearly see the periodicity. This is an ordered and periodic crystal. And the rotational symmetries, rotational symmetries that are allowed in these crystals are one, two, three, and four, and six. One, two, three, four, and six. No five, and nothing beyond six. Why so? Because of geometrical reasons. It is true, it is okay. So you will not, you do not expect to see any lattice, which is periodic, with five-fold rotational symmetry. Okay, fine. Now, let me take you to the diffraction space. This is an electron diffraction, not X-ray diffraction, an electron diffraction taken by an electron microscope. And uh, it has a sec contained the same information as X-ray diffraction. The only difference is, which is an important difference, that in an electron microscope, every crystal, the smallest crystal, you can look only at that crystal because the resolution of an electron microscope is very high, and the magnification used can reach beyond a million easily. So, this is a diffraction pattern from a single crystal in the electron microscope, and that single crystal is periodic. And this is an electron diffraction pattern. Periodicity, well, let's look at the periodicity. You look in this direction, there is periodicity. You look in this direction, you see the periodicity. You look in this direction, any direction that you choose, periodicity. This, Christ, this diffraction pattern exists. <laughs> this, this diffraction pattern exists in a mathematical space. Don't be scared. In a mathematical space which we call the reciprocal space. I will not dwell on that. But there is a space with an imaginary. We, we invented it. It's a mathematical space called the reciprocal space, which allows us to decipher the structure of atoms, the structure of, of crystals, where the atomic position, by just analyzing the diffraction pattern. This is what we do routinely by doing electron microscopy. Also here, the rotational symmetries are one, two, three, four, and six, no five, and nothing beyond six. And there was, no, there was not a single observation for 70 years of anything different than that. Everything was ordered and periodic. And then something amazing happened. In 1992, the International Union of Crystallographers, this is a very strict, strong, precision body of mathematical crystallographers. I mean, these are no nonsense people. And they redefined crystal. And look at this definition, how beautiful it is. Let us read it and see what is the beauty in this definition. They say the following, by crystal we mean any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. It doesn't say crystal is, it says by crystal we mean soft. Any solid having an essentially discrete diffraction diagram. It's a poem, it's not a definition. Well, like that. Think about the body it came from. Mathematical crystallographers write poems now. And by aperiodic crystal, we mean any crystal, listen, in which three-dimensional lattice periodicity can be considered to be absent. Oh, like that. This is a humble definition. This is, a, this is an open definition. And the humble scientist is a good scientist. Somebody who is listening, somebody who is open to new ideas. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't criticize, but don't knock it. Don't destroy it when it's young. Listen, maybe there, maybe there is wisdom there. Now, there are new discoveries every day. Most of them are just artifacts. They are bad news, most. But sometimes, just sometimes, you have really a very interesting and surprising and right discovery that can create a paradigm shift. And this new definition of a crystal is a paradigm shift in crystallography. Totally a paradigm shift.
Okay. Now, let me take you to the discovery. I will now show you my logbook. Now, every time I give this lecture, I apologize. This logbook was meant for me only, it was not meant for your eyes, so it's written in a sloppy way, shorthand, um, you know, just for me. But it is also shows you how important it is to write a logbook of your experiments. The date, the material, what you did, so that later on you can understand what you did. So let's look at it, right, just briefly. SAD doesn't mean that I was said that morning, it means selected area diffraction. And the date is April 8, 1982, and the material I was working was aluminum, 25% manganese, and this is the plate number on the electron microscope. We were taking plates on glass, it were glass plates. Nowadays it's CCD. Between the glass plates and the CCD, we had plastic plates. This was a transition period. Now everything is digital, of course. So I take these pictures, and then I see this picture, 1724, 36K means a picture with a magnification of 36,000, and this was a very interesting one, and I say, wow, let's look at the diffraction pattern. I look at the diffraction pattern, 10-fold. This was about 10 o'clock of April 8, 1982. The Nobel Committee said that this is a rare occasion in which a discovery can be dated to an hour in the history, not to a year, like in the year 1912, when Lowe discovered X-ray diffraction. This is 10 o'clock, April 8, 1982. Very rare. Okay, and this is because I have it in my logbook. Let me show you the picture. So this is the picture uh, taken by an electron microscope, and the magnification was 36,000. What you see here is something very simple. You see, each one of these, this is a single crystal. It means that the atoms are arranged in it in a certain way, and all are in the same direction. This is another single crystal. Look at this black crystal, these black crystals. Black crystals mean that the specimen diffracts heavily, that there is almost no intensity in the transmitted beam. I, will, I will talk fast, I cannot explain that. But let's look at the diffraction pattern. I look at the diffraction pattern, and I look at this, and I say, tenfold? Three question marks? Why? Because when you look at it, as I did, I started to, to look, I said, well, oh, that's very odd. What is the rotation symmetry? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten? No, no, cannot be. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, tenfold. So this is one surprising. You know, one, two, three, four, and six are the allowed rotation symmetry. No five and nothing beyond six. The other thing is that I lost, there is no periodicity. Periodicity is gone. You see, if you take this distance from here to here and multiply it by two, you get here. And there is nothing there. No periodicity. Well, it turns out that the ratio of distances between this distance, you divide this by this, you get irrational number. Of course, you cannot do it by measuring a division because it's an irrational number but this comes from theory. But this is the number that you get, 1.618 and so on. It's an irrational number called the Fibonacci number. And when you exit my talk, you will know about Mr. Fibonacci because it's important to know about him. He was a wonderful mathematician and he invented quasi-periodicity in the year 1202. This is 810 years ago. Now, this was not the only diffraction pattern from the microscope. You see, when you take a, a diffraction pattern in the microscope, your specimen, you can tilt your specimen, and you can rotate it. So you can take all these diffraction patterns and decipher the structure. Okay, now, this, this discovery, as you heard in the introduction, was made at the NBS, National Bureau of Standards, in the year um, 1982, and I was there for two years. When I started to talk about my discovery, I was told that uh, such things do not exist, and please read the book, and I will tell you about this shortly. But in 1984, I came back to the Technion, I met the first person who was willing to collaborate with me, his name is Professor Ilan Blech, 
he left the Technion after that, he now lives in California, and we have sent a paper for publication. Ilan Blech contributed a model that described how such material could form. We sent the paper to Journal of Applied Physics, and within two weeks, it was back on my desk with a letter that this paper will not interest the community of physicists. Why don't you send it to a metallurgical journal? So I sent it to a metallurgical journal. And they accepted it and published it, and this is the paper. But they, they published it deep into 1985, in June of 1985, and we are still in September of 1984, and I am back at MBS for the summer. I showed my results to Professor John Kahn, an eminent thermodynamic person, and he, we had some discussion, and he said, Danny, we have something fantastic here. You sent it to a long-range publication. It will be published deep into 1985. Why don't we publish another paper short, send it to a quick publication, fast publication, and this is what we did. John invited another person named Denis Gratias, who is a mathematical crystallographer from France. We sent this paper, and it was published in uh, November 12, 1984. And when this was published, hell broke loose. Because immediately, I started to get telephone calls from around the world. Danny, we have it, we have it, this is fantastic. And in no time, a community of eminent physicists, chemists, mathematicians, material scientists, formed around the world and created the science of quasi-periodic materials. So they took my discovery, and together we developed a science from it. Okay, icosahedral symmetry. Let me show you a simple way to understand icosahedral symmetry. This is a football. Nowadays they have a different design for football, for those of you who are football fans. But this was up until recently the design. It has a five-fold rotation symmetry here, as you can see. Football is, was, was used to be made of patches, pentagons and hexagons. This is fivefold, clearly fivefold, clearly twofold, clearly threefold. And icosahedral symmetry has these, uh, these features. I bet that uh, the football players do not know that they play with an icosahedral symmetry. Now, let's talk about Leonardo Fibonacci of Pisa. This is Leonardo when he was young. This is uh, a statue on his graveyard. His grave is just behind the inclined tower of Pisa. If you visit the inclined tower of Pisa, 20 meters behind it, there is a graveyard under a roof. Go visit him there, say hello for me. I mean, he was so great. He was the greatest mathematician. Now, this is what I want you to remember. Fibonacci rabbits, because this will take you into quasi-periodicity, and it will take you into irrational numbers. Okay, Mr. Fibonacci designed the following experiment. He said, we have a female rabbit in the first month, and, and a friend comes to visit her, and he goes away. So now she's pregnant, of course. And she gives birth to a little one in the second month. In the third month, she gives birth to another little one, and this little one matures. Okay? In the next month, she gives birth to a little one. Every month she gives birth to a little one, and the little one has one month to mature. That's it. This is Fibonacci theory. On the left, you see the number of rabbits in each month. So we have one in the first month, and two here, and three here, and five here. These are Fibonacci numbers. Now, Fibonacci numbers has two interesting features and one important one. The interesting is that the number of rabbits in each month is the sum of the number of rabbits in the two previous months. So eight is three plus five, and five is two plus three, and 21 is eight plus 13. This is rule number one. Rule number two is that if you continue this to infinity, then the ratio of the number of rabbits in a given month, down there in infinity, divided by the previous month, will give you the Fibonacci number tau. And this is the second equ equation here. This is the first one, this is the second one, and this is the number it will give you. Take this number, divide by this, but not here, down there, when there is a very large number of rabbits then it will give you the Fibonacci number. Okay, now let us look at this Fibonacci series, and I want to show you just one more thing, because we now enter the field of quasi-periodicity. Look here. Look at the size of the rabbit. Large, large, small, large, I'm sorry, large, small, large, large, small, large, small, large, large, small, large, large, small, and so on and so on. You can look for a motif that repeats itself, in a periodic fashion, there is none. 
There is no motif of any size which repeats itself. Look here. You have an order array. If I ask you to continue this, you know the rules. With the rabbits, you can continue it. There is a rule, there is a mathematical rule. But there is no periodicity. This is a quasi-periodic array in one dimension, along a line. Okay. So we have irrational numbers, such as the Fibonacci number um, here, and we have the irish, the, and we have the aperiodic theory here, which is quasi-periodic. Okay. This is Fibonacci. Now, this is in one dimension. What about quasi-periodic array? In two dimensions, on a plane, we have Penrose tiles. Penrose tiles are an array of tiles. There are only two tiles here, if you neglect the colors. There is a thin rhombus and a thick rhombus. And you can tile a plane according to matching rules. There are rules how to do that. But you can tile the plane, and then this is a quasi-periodic array. It means that there is no motif that repeats itself anywhere in this array. Two dimensions. What about three dimensions? We live in a world of three dimensions. Yeah, three dimension is a quasi-periodic crystal. And this is one crystal that was, this is a picture of one that was taken in my laboratory by one of my assistants, Ina Popov. And uh, you can clearly see, see the, this is two microns, so it's a small one. Five-fold facets all over the place. Okay, so this is quasi-periodicity. Now the story. <clears throat> when I started to talk about my uh, discovery at NBS, the reaction varied between John Kahn, who was positive and said, Danny, this material is telling us something and I challenge you to find out what it is, to a negative reaction. My group leader came one day to my office, smiling sheepishly, putting a book on my desk, book of X-ray diffraction, and he said, Danny, please read this book so that you will know that what you're talking about cannot be. And I said to him, I know this book. I am a teacher at the Technion. I don't have to read it. I'm telling you my material is not in the book. <laughs> he took the book, came back a couple of days later and said, okay, Danny, you are really a disgrace to my group. I don't want to be associated with you. Please leave my group. So I left the group. And it was not so traumatic as it sounds because I didn't have to leave my office or my laboratory. All I have to do is, in terms of reporting to his secretary, I reported to another secretary of another group leader who adopted the scientific orphan, and that was that. But the feeling was that of rejection. And during 1982 till 1984, when I published the first paper, this was the feeling that I had. So, it was, not, it was not traumatic, but it was not nice. It was not easy. Yeah. 1984, we published the first paper. And when we did that, you would think that that's it. There is a growing community of quasi-periodic scientists. Powerful, amazing, young, avant-garde scientists. You think that everybody will accept the new structure of crystal, not so fast. Because from 1984 to 1987, the, the body of a, the International Union of Crystallographers, five more minutes, said, bring us X-ray diffraction results. We do not believe in electron diffraction. That, that's not precise, that's not good. Bring us X-ray diffraction. We could not do that. We, the community of, X of the quasi-periodic uh, scientists could not do that because in order to perform an X-ray diffraction pattern, to take a diffraction pattern, you need a crystal of some size, maybe like a grain of sand, a fraction of a millimeter, but something that you can feel between your fingers. We did not have that. Our crystals were microns in size. And it took three years to grow large enough crystals for X-ray diffraction. And my colleagues in France and in Japan in the year 1987 sent me this picture, this came from Japan, I have similar one from China, from uh, France. And when I showed this in the International Union of Crystallographers meeting in Perth, Australia, 1987, they said, okay, Danny, now you're talking. And formed a committee that redefined crystal. This was a paradigm shift, a very significant paradigm shift. 
Okay, so you say, all right, now everybody accepts. Uh-uh. No. Still there was objection, and the objection came from a very powerful person, Professor Linus Pauling, who was probably the greatest chemist of the 20th century, if not one of the greatest. He wrote the books, he taught us a lot about the fundamentals of chemistry, and he, he stood on stages and he rejected the quasi-periodic nature of, of quasi-periodic materials, and he said, he was a very flamboyant speaker. I don't know if anybody of you saw him ever. He was a wonderful speaker, like begging. I mean, he was standing on stages, wave, you know, waving hands, and he had a large crowd of believers. He was the godfather of the uh, American Chemical Society, hundreds of thousands of members. And he said, Danny Schechtman is talking nonsense. There are no quasi-periodic crystals, just quasi-scientists. He continued this, and he, he, but he was not alone. He was supported by hundreds of thousands of chemists in, in the United States. He died in 1984, and with that, the opposition died, and now everybody accepts quasi-periodic materials. Now, I want to mention a few names that contributed seminal contribution, and then we will finish. Roger Penrose, I told you about Penrose style. Roger Penrose and Adam McKay are two eminent, um, Adam McKay is a mathematician, Roger Penrose is basically a physicist, but he's also a great mathematician and two great scientists. They designed the Penrose styles, and Adam McKay showed that they can diffract, sharp diffraction spots, so a seminal contribution. Ilan Blech, Denis Gartias, and John Kahn wrote the first paper with me. Actually, Ilan Blech wrote the first one, but it was probably second, so you know the history. These are great people. Last but not least, Dobrevin and Paul Steinhardt. Dobrevin is a, a professor of physics at the Technion. Paul Stein is a professor in also physics in um, Princeton. And they designed a tiling model to show how quasi-crystals are built, and this is the uh, leading um, explanation today, in addition to the uh, model that Ilan Blech proposed, which is a physical model. So now we know that while as before, order was synonym to periodicity, periodicity was the only order in, in, in crystals, now we know that order can be either periodic or quasi-periodic, and it is open to new discoveries. That's the beauty. It is open. The community is willing to accept new discoveries because the definition of a crystal is open. I would like to finish by asking a question. Usually you ask question. I will ask the question, okay? I, but I will also answer it. Why is it that quasi-periodic materials were never discovered before 1982? You see, for the 70 years, hundreds of thousands of crystals were discovered and analyzed by hardcore X-ray crystallographers. I mean, these are very serious people. And no one saw quasi-periodic materials? Is it because they are very rare? Or is it because they're not stable? You touch them, they disintegrate? Or maybe they're difficult to make? Or maybe they're made of esoteric material that nobody uses? No. Quasi-periodic materials are not rare. There are hundreds upon hundreds of them. And here is a partial list of, of some of the quasi-periodic uh, composition based on aluminum alone. And there are such as based on copper and iron and nickel. And so, no, they're not abundant. So maybe because they're, very, they're not stable. Well, some of them are not stable. Here is a list of stable quasi-periodic materials. But one well, not stable, what does it mean? It means that if you heat them up, to 400 degrees C, then they will transform. But at room temperature, they're stable. That's not the reason they were not discovered before. Maybe they're difficult to make, and I, with my magic hands, managed to make one. Mm, not so. Very easy to make. You can cast them. You can rapidly solidify them. Single crystal grows, electro deposition, CVD, PVD. Anywhere you, you produce any metallic alloy, you can produce quasi-periodic materials. Easy, cheap, not esoteric materials. We talk about abundant materials. So why is it that quasi-periodic materials were never discovered before 1982? Let me give you my answer. From this point, it's become subjective. Number one, TM, transmission-like microscopy. 
Quasi periodic materials should have been discovered by transmission electron microscope. No other tool could have discovered them because they were very small. So, among the, all the scientists that do crystallography, most work on X ray by X ray diffraction. Some do transmission microscopy. It limits the number to those who work on the electron microscope, which I was. Second, you have to be a professional on the electron microscope. You see, there are thousands upon thousands, hundreds of thousands of students around the world use the electron microscope as a wonderful magnifying glass. But the electron microscope is a powerful analysis tool, and you should know how to use the power of the electron microscope. You should be a professional. And this is my message to students around the world. If you want to succeed in your career, become an expert in something that you like. Find something that you like. Young doctors, find something that you like, but become an expert in that. And if you become an expert in something, I promise you, you'll have a wonderful career. How to choose what? Choose whatever you like. If you want to, be, to choose something in medicine, something in physics, something in chemistry, you want to play the saxophone, fine, but become an expert. And this will pro promise you a great career. And many people are not professional in electron microscope. In our department at Technion, a leader in Israel in electron microscopy, we produce over 40 years maybe 10 electron microscopies, and thousands use our microscope. So this limits the number even further, not only to TM operators, but to TM experts. Only those could have been discovered. And then tenacity. You discover something like a Rottweiler. Don't let go. Don't let go until you analyze what it is. In most cases, it will be an artifact. But in some cases, just in some cases, you made a great discovery. Don't let go, just hold on to it. Let me give you a counter example, a nice story. There's a, the man who did his PhD in Europe somewhere who saw my tenfold rotation symmetry diffraction pattern before me. How do I know that? His professor told me. His professor told me the following story. Years after your discovery, he tells me, I go through the slides of my students and I pick one, and your diffraction pattern is there, and the date is before your discovery. I call my student, now a leading manager in the industry with a PhD, and I say to him, you know, you saw the diffraction pattern of Danny Schechner before him? He said the ex-student, yes, professor, of course I know. I said the professor, why didn't you tell me? He says the student, you know, professor, if I told you, you would want me to stay for two more years on my PhD? I didn't want that. <laughs> Tenacity. You see something interesting and strange and different, don't let go until you find out what it is. And then you have to believe in yourself. Believe in yourself if you are a professional. If you are a professional in any subject and you check your results and it is okay, be your worst critic. And if you, if you approve your own results, stand tall to defend them. Last but not least, you have to have some courage because when you stand in front of the top leaders of the scientific community of the world and they say that you talk nonsense, okay, you have to have some courage. My promotion at the Technion was denied a year after the great explosion and, it, the, the, and the promotion was from a senior lecturer to, uh, to an uh, associate professor. But this, this, this is nothing. These are the steps that uh, anybody goes when he makes a controversial discovery. There is a book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. I recommend you read it when you have a chance. It tells you the story, what happens every time a controversial discovery is made, what are the stages? And I was there in each and every page. Thank you very much. <laughs>